My name is Ariana Chul. I'm director of King's Digital Lab, which is an RAC team embedded in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's College London. This paper is a presentation of the mission and activities document that we had to uh, write in 2022. So my first slide is about saying why do we actually need to write a mission activities document in the first place? We have enough work to do. So in our case, this was due, first of all, to the fact that our funding director left for a different role in 2022. I was an appointed director, so it was a chance for our faculty to think again what we do, why we do it, um, why we master if at all. Uh, no, that's a joke. Um, but also to, in a, in a way, renew our communication strategy. So trying to work better with researchers uh, and our uh, leadership, senior management leadership, in defining um, what we can help with in the research environment we are embedded in. Um, and last but not least, I think it was a good opportunity also to redefine as, as our me mechanism for resource allocation within the lab and capacity planning. So obviously, it was a lot of work, especially back and forth with senior management to define these things, to agree on, on a common language, on an agreed language. Um, but I think hopefully at the end of the talk, it'll be clear it was also an opportunity in a way. Um, so what, what's in the in that mission activities document? Uh, the blog post that is linked from the abstract gives a lot more details, but basically defines our core remit, um, which is very common to many RSC teams embedded within embedded or central teams in universities, so contributing to mainly research funded uh, projects, funded research projects. Um, and then in addition to that, so to deliver those high quality contribution to projects, we need to do a series of other activities, which we define in the document as operational overhead. Um, and very importantly, I'll say more about this, we include in, in operational overhead also our agency, if you like, in defining um, RSE driven research themes, which were presented at the conference last year by my colleague, um, Neil Jakeman. And in addition to that, the document defines a sort of a list and many of additional activities that we can contribute to as a team. Um, these are divided into a kind of block, what we call research services catalog, I'll say more about that, but basically the aim of that, of those activities is to enhance research in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Second, college contribution, so how we can contribute to the college. And third, consultancy. Um, so this is the, the structure, the table of content of the document. It's not very long, about seven pages, but still, there's quite a lot in there. And then you'll see the research services catalog includes a kind of sub hierarchy. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so in terms of mission, I, I said this already, obviously, uh, we are a research software engineering laboratory in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, charged with enabling and delivering high quality uh, digital research projects. The, um, the document outlines also a little bit our governance, so how we work in collaboration with uh, faculty leadership, in particular with respect to research, but obviously also in terms of administration, business, finances, and so on. Um, Interestingly, the, the, the mission here kind of uh, found, um, if you like, a uh, legitimization in, uh, in the RSC Society UK wording. So what, what says there, the research software engineer work with researchers to gain an understanding of the problems they face and then develop, maintain and extend software to provide the answers. It was extracted from, at the time, the, the website of the, of the RSC Society UK. So that just to say that, again, the community kind of legitimized itself and it's a, um, it, it was useful for us. Um, to use that. Um, so the primary value of KDL and the market position in Lighten is contribution to high quality grant funded project with significant technical requirements. And obviously there is a blurred line there what does significant really mean, but this talk is not about that. I can tell you more if you're interested. Um, so for first, first point to make, so this idea of the primary value being inclusive across project life cycle is obviously not new. Other in, others in the RSC community have defined RSC contributions all the way from the initial contact, if you like early concept phase, definition of projects, all the way to maintenance and, and sustainability of software and products. So we, we basically align to that. So we say that we contribute to pre grant analysis as support, including early concept phase. Uh, we contribute to grant applications, including technical documentation, for example, very important eliciting requirements is an, it takes a lot of our time at pre-project phase. Uh, in terms of reference, feasibility assessment, all that is part of, of what we do. And then with respect to funding, so that's obviously a phase that happens even before usually funding comes in. Um, and then with respect to funded project, there are obviously again, different, different aspects we contribute to, analysis, design and development. Um, but also contribution to research outputs. If some of you 
attended a session by Simon Ettrick about the, um, the REF and the, the, the importance of uh, different roles, also non-academic roles contributing to digital artifacts as research outputs. This is gonna become more and more important for RACs. Maintenance, obviously, again, um, this is something that others in the community has identified as an area with RIC uh, teams um, kind of make the difference um, with respect to developing sustainable product. In our case, what we maintain is usually covered by service, service level agreements. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and then also project management is something that we contribute to. Um, if you're interested, we have uh, all our project templates are available on our GitHub um, wiki. They more or less align to Agile DSDM, but they've been adapted quite heavily to, to the research context we work within. And when I say research context, I don't necessarily mean uh, humanities, art, humanities, and cultural heritage, but I mean, yes, a research context. So close to business, but different. Um, the document also highlights um, the priorities that the lab has in, in allocating um, resources. We are a track listed facility, research facility, so we also have... Um, in a way, guidance based on how we calculate our rate that doesn't allow us to do uh, too much of certain things that would change uh, basically our the, the way that we uh, we bring in research income. Um, so first priority, obviously, is working with colleagues in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, as I said, in, in funded projects. And even before we had this mission and activities document already since 2017, um, we started um, producing this early funding strategy. So that's a document that defined KPIs um, year on year and we socialize it with faculty. So it's a good mechanism. We have a good mechanism there. Second priority, what we call research services catalogs, which includes, as we will, as we will see in a minute, all, their, all sorts of different activities that are typically non-funded. We are, I didn't say, we are underwritten by our faculty. Um, third, funded project with external partners, so other universities, glam sector, galleries, museums, archives, um, industry partners, and so on. Um, for this, this, this third element as well, we have good mechanisms to, to kind of define targets and monitor that. So if I'm very frank, I think that it's the second element that is still quite hard and challenging for us to um, plan. So at the moment, we take, um, we organize these activities based on an ad hoc basis. And we're working towards having a better method of doing that. Um, sorry, I should have said we track our all of our time. So what you see there, which is probably not very visible, is um, uh, the way our time was distributed across different activities in the last year financial uh, report. We can also do a little bit of commercial consultancy. But as I said, because we are a tracked um, listed research facilities, we cannot, these, these activities cannot lead to an overshoot in track billable hours. But again, to be frank, we don't really have a lot of time, unfortunately, to do much of commercial consultancy, even if we wanted to. Um, I did mention that operational overheads takes a big chunk of what we do. And this is, again, probably clear to for, for some aspect of operational overheads are default for everyone and are clear for everyone. So, for example, that you need to um, allocate some resources to governance or HR or uh, the sort of things that are normal for everyone. But there are some areas that I think in KDL experience have become quite important and maybe are less recognized. And I think it's important to make those explicit because they could become an important investment for RIC teams. And in our opinion, the way that you can also succeed and do good things and support projects well. For example, number five, KDL staff development and experimentation. Each of us had, uh, has in our contract a 10% time uh, allocated to experiment with things. So outside funded projects. And very often these 10% projects lead to then funded projects. Sometimes they don't, they're just failures, they're just trials. Sometimes they're just indeed experimentation with new techniques, but it's the way we think to um, incubate innovation and also find a little bit of headspace outside the, the busy, uh, busy pace of the work of the lab. Um, another area that I think is very important is optimizing business, pro business processes. We worked a lot. I mentioned, for example, our project templates in defining our processes, in socializing them within the lab, and we continuously work on, on that. And again, I think it's important to, outside the funded project work, uh, leave some time aside to do that kind of work. Um, so yes, personal development, very important. It leads obviously to lab development as well. I mentioned the research themes earlier. At the moment, we are our research themes are around digital creativity, for example, immersive experience using AI and working with theater companies and so on is one of the areas we're developing. 
uh, machine learning is another area um, and working with uh, indigenous communities in the digital humanities and the glam sector is another area we are trying to develop further. And then obviously in the hierarchy, this leads also to contributing to the community or communities, ideally, like we're doing here today. Um, resource service catalog, so as I said, um, we, we kind of try to itemize and negotiate with faculty. What are the other things that we can do when we have time uh, and based on demand? Um, and I'll try to say a little bit about um, each of these things briefly. But again, as I said, if you're interested, you can find more in the blog post. Um, so what, what do we mean by digital research and data capacity development in the faculty? We mean things such as, for example, contributing or defining appropriate quality standards. So we might not be involved, um, or we, we might not be a technical partner with a faculty colleague, but we, we might be willing to review what they're doing in terms of, I don't know, developing their data set or some data collection practices, maybe with a view in the future of working together, but we don't necessarily have to. Um, or for example, contributing to arts and humanities research leadership. So we might sit in faculty committees where, I don't know, the data strategy for AI has been defined and things like that. Um, we obviously do quite a bit of internal consultancy. Again, this is quite common for RSE groups from what I can see, for example, from bookable drop-in slots. This year we haven't initiated that yet. And actually post-pandemic has become a bit difficult to do this in person. Um, but for example, sometimes we organize also workshops with specific departments or specific uh, research groups. Um, yes, we have uh, several things there that clarify, I think, what this means. Quite important, I think, is the early co concept review. Usually, obviously, that's not funded, uh, but it does lead uh, more often than not into then collaborations with colleagues. Um, one of the areas that for us is been as, as eaten a, a big chunk of our time outside of funded project is archiving and sustainability. This is mainly due to the history of the lab. The lab was set up in 2015, but um, uh, it was in a way in a chain of uh, development and work with humanities computing and digital humanities at King's for a long time, dating back to the 70s. So we still maintain some, um, uh, especially web application, web environments that date back to the 90s, obviously with upgrades and so on. So you can imagine that this is an area that we have to dedicate quite a lot of time to. So the, defining the processes around what we maintain, what we not, what we decommission, that's part of the process improvements we have to work on. Um, I appreciate you cannot really read the diagram here, but this is an example of what came out of some of those process improvement analysis, uh, what we decommission, what are the, the criteria um, that we use, um, how do we govern the whole archiving and sustainability process, what, what technical solution we adopt, but also how do we define product owners, for example, where, where principal investigator might move to a different institution and so on. So we have a, a set of guidelines that, that guide that process. Um, capability, increasing capability in arts humanities students. Again, this is quite uh, uh, common in, uh, in RSC teams to support training activities with students. We don't do a lot of that because also because the track framework limits us to do a little bit of uh, standard training. Um, but for example, we, we do guest lectures, we host some internships, uh, visiting students and so on. These are examples of what we did um, last year. So obviously, uh, for example, I don't know, contributing to the product development course in the Digital Humanities Master or coding in the humanities. So quite um, self-evident, if you like, how our contribution could help in those courses, usually with a practical outlook. So we present case studies um, that help the students kind of see the work they're doing in a more practical way. Um, we also were engaged in no standard training. Again, I think this is quite common now for universities to to start also taking on these more vocational or giving the imprint to uh, professionalizing courses. Uh, so King's with the fourth rev uh, commercial partner initiated this user experience uh, course and our senior designer at the time, uh, she helped um, reviewing the curriculum for this. So that's an example of a research service catalog activity that we did. Um, in terms of opportunity or challenges, um, the, this work also in a way made, made clear to, to the faculty that yes, we can contribute also to educational activities to a certain extent. Um, and so at the moment, we, there is actually an ongoing review to see whether uh, KDL could contribute more to educa the educational offer of the faculty and possibly the college as well. So last point is around uh, college contribution. So obviously all I said and um, all the activities that I've described indirectly contribute to the 
college strategy and, and operation around digital research and data strategy. But there are also obviously more specific inputs. So for example, uh, taking part in specific committees. Uh, recently, King's um, set up a, an institute for artificial intelligence, and we 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 have a well, I, I'm the representative in that in the uh, steering committee for the institute. But there might be ad hoc working groups that are set up uh, once in a while where RSE expertise is relevant. So um, we we associate um, one member of the team to to some of these groups. Um, and also, obviously, development of digital research and data capacity via training might be another input that uh, we gave in the past. For example, there was a software carpentry uh, program run by uh, colleagues in the college, and we contributed to that. Now we have a central um, e-research team with uh, James Graham heading the RSE team, and so we hope that uh, some of those training activities might develop further, so there might be more input that we can give um, there. Um, so the, what, what are the benefits then? I mean, this is a list of benefits that uh, worked for these specific college contributions, but I think it's useful as a general conclusion to, to this presentation. Um, I think, first of all, it was useful for us to do this because it reiterates that RSC expertise is valid across different layers, both project life cycles uh, phases, but also indeed very different type of expertise from peer reviewing, for example, proposals, also when we're not involved and we can contribute to improve those for colleagues. And we had very nice um, feedback on that front to all the way to obviously the hardcore design and development work of software modules, components, and so on, interfaces um, and data set analysis and so on. It was also useful for workload management so if you, we start um, looking at each other's workload and realize that we are spread through too thin across too many different activities, this is uh, in a way a way to manage expectation with faculty and, and, and redefine our workload model or maybe tweak, uh, change, reduce, um, where we cannot do um, everything with the limited, I didn't say, but our team is 13 people, which is for the arts and humanities, great, uh, but it is still a small team after all. And um, it was also useful for delegation. In theory, only half of my time is supposed to be dedicated to management and directorship of the lab. But obviously, if I attend all the committees that are out there and we are requested to attend, it would be impossible for me, for me to do that. So again, defining contributions allowed us also to delegate more within the team. Um, and then last but not least, I mentioned that already, um, is the it was useful to manage um, expectations with the faculty and in general demand on us. So yes, it's true, as an RSC team, we have all these talents, we have all these expertise, we can contribute to all these things, but if we do a lot of this, we cannot do this, this other thing. Um, and so it gives some leverage, I think, both agency to the team itself, but also, if you like, agency to the faculty um, to be a little bit more proactive and decide where really our resources are best used, maybe not to make marketing websites for research, for example. Um, yeah, this is it. I, in, the, in the blog post, you'll find also a link to a template on our GitHub um, uh, pages where basically I stripped down most of the content by, but kept the structure and, um, and the tables of, the, those, of that mission and activities document in case it can be useful for others or you can completely strip it down, adopt that app, whatever. And yeah, happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, so our first question from um, Slido. Do you think there is added pressure on DH RSEs to justify their own existence to funders, university management, colleagues, etc.? I think definitely, yes. Um, partially because we're still a little bit of the black sheep, so there are many. Um, partially because obviously, traditionally, uh, these, uh, for example, the, the faculties, the, the, these, these research domains aren't traditionally technical. So there is sometimes a step back or a sense of, really, are you really going to be useful for us? Are you going to uh, initiate a very positivistic way of looking at uh, our material? So there is a bit of pushback there. Um, what was the other question? So funders, I think with funders, you know, funders is very important. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you were at the Ukri presentation, but I still feel that um, other areas had a lot of um, support in RSCs, so EPSRC Research Council, for example, initiated all those RSC fellowships. They also initiated a program for software sustainability. We didn't have any of that in the arts and humanities. So my hope is that even if it's great that UCRI is acting across research domains and we all benefit from those 
schemes and funding, I still think that we need a little bit more of a push. So it'd be good to get that support from funders, but we're working on that. And you, if you're staying for the panel, you'll hear more about uh, some of those activities. I think maybe time for one more. Uh, you mentioned KDL is underwritten, moved, underwritten by the faculty. Are there plans to move towards self-sufficiency? Is that feasible in ANH? So we are underwritten, but we do have a cost recovery plan. And actually, we set that up ourselves. So when I started in KDL, uh, the ambition was quite high. I think we had set a cost recovery between 60 and 70 percent. And we did reach 60 for the first three years. Then COVID hit and our cost recovery went down a bit. At the moment, I would say it's more around 50 percent. Sometimes, depending on the across the year, you can see variations. Um, so it's not impossible, especially in terms of research funding, to cover some of your costs and uh, our willingness and, and our agreement with the fact that we, we try to do that as much as possible. But my, my focus on operational overheads was also to clarify that if you want a lab to perform well, you also have all these other things that are unfunded that need to be considered. So I guess that was, um, yeah, so it is feasible, but be careful um, on what sort of expectation you put forward in terms of cost recovery. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are a few more, but I think we'll wrap it there just to get set up for the panel. Okay. Once again, thank you very much to our speaker, Ariana. Thank you.